so excited to watch two of our students be baptized and uh what a, what a blessing. So uh, for those of you who may be visiting with us, my name is Jay Viverka. I'm our Next Gen Minister here. And uh, uh, it is a joy to serve this church in that capacity. And uh, we are excited to have you uh, with us today. Um, all of us walk through life with expectations, right? If you're visiting with us, maybe you came to church with a certain set of expectations this morning. Uh, maybe you thought, you know, there's a particular way that music is going to sound or um, maybe you you anticipated people being dressed in a certain way. You had these expectations about what church would be like, maybe based off of what you grew up with, what you have experienced in the past. But we all walk through life with expectations. Researchers have even uh, discovered that babies develop expectations before they can talk. So even before your child is telling you what their expectations were, they are expressing them on their face, right? You've seen this. You've, you can tell when your baby is surprised at something. They had developed those expectations early. And not just expectation, but anticipation, which is sort of our emotional investment in that expected future, right? We anticipate things. And anticipation can be uh, positive. Uh, it can be maybe negative. It can, it can be excitement. It can be nervousness. Um, so I was, the, I was the kid in my house on Christmas morning that was always the first one up. Like it, it was just understood that I got the ball rolling. Uh, I was up at 5 a.m., Right, and then it went, went to my sister's room and my brother's rooms. We all got, we went to get my parents, and that was just how it went. Right, there was this just this excitement for me around Christmas morning, and I anticipated opening presents and being with family and traveling to see cousins and all these things, and I was just excited. So I would be the first one up. So our expectations can come with positive sort of excitement, anticipation, but they can also bring kind of a nervousness, right? I remember a few years ago, one of our boys was uh, playing um, rec baseball and my boys are, are younger. So this wasn't like college scouts were not present. Like there was no like real, like it wasn't on like local television or anything, uh, but it was the first round of the playoffs and they were getting ready to play. And there was this little boy on the team who uh, was so just amped up for this game. I don't know if he was nervous or excited or probably a little bit of both, but he didn't sleep well the, the night before. And he didn't eat well that morning. And so by the time the game was supposed to start, he was just all kinds of out of whack. And before, about five minutes before the first pitch, he just loses it in the dugout, right? And so then, then there's this scramble, right? But I mean, it's rec baseball. So like they just pulled the umpire out of the parking lot and were like, hey, you want to umpire a baseball game? And so there's dads are running around, like throwing water on the, the dugout floor. And we're just trying to get this game going. He was so amped up with anticipation over this baseball game that his body responded in kind of a negative way. Every Christmas uh, season, we come with anticipation, with expectation. Maybe you're expecting a certain gift under the tree. Uh, these days, it's really easy to expect a certain gift because now you just send a link to someone. You say, buy this, right? When I was growing up, we would have to go to the store and my mother would make us point at the very thing and where it was in the store. She'd be like, all right, where, to show me where it is. And then we had to just pray that the store didn't rearrange things between then and Christmas, right? Because then it was all lost. But now you just send the link and you click the link and it shows up at your house. It's amazing. So maybe you're expecting a certain gift. Maybe your expectation is tied to certain Christmas celebrations. Or we're going to decorate the tree at this time and in this way. Or maybe we're going to sing carols together or we're going to, play Christmas music or whatever that might look like, we all come with expectations, which is sometimes why that first Christmas together as a married couple, there can be some, some tension and some conversations that have to happen, right? Because you're both coming with expectations. Both your parents are coming with expectations. And you've got to figure out, all right, what is our, what is our expectation now as a new family around this, this holiday and some of the things that we're going to be doing? My question for you this morning is, what expectations do you have of Jesus this Christmas? And how do those expectations reveal what you believe about the Savior and about his gospel? What expectations do you have of Jesus this Christmas? Have you ever thought what the anticipation was like 2,000 years ago? Like Jesus is, is getting ready to come on the scene. That Jews don't know that, but they're anticipating that the Messiah is coming they're anticipating with excitement. They are anticipating the Messiah. And what did that expectation that they had reveal about their own heart? Because our expectations reveal 
the beliefs that reside in our heart. And so in our text today, we're gonna be looking at one man who had been waiting for the Messiah with great anticipation, with great expectation. You can turn to Luke 2 if you haven't already. We'll be in Luke 2 starting in verse 25. This man's name was Simeon. And so if you would follow along with me as I read, it says there that there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful to be able to gather to celebrate your son, to celebrate our Savior to delight in the good news of the gospel that he has come to rescue us, to redeem us, to show us the way to eternal life and to shine light into our dark, sinful hearts. Lord, we come this morning not simply to learn, not simply to be taught, but to be transformed, to be transformed by your word and by the power of your spirit. So Lord, guide our time Help us to see Christ and to delight in him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the kids have read for us the beginning of Luke 2 today, the birth of Christ, and several days after Jesus is born, his, his father Joseph, his mother Mary, they, they make this trek to Jerusalem. They're gonna perf- do, the, do the things that were expected of them under the law, right? The different rituals that were part of new birth there in that day and age under the temple. And so they, so they come to Jerusalem and they're headed to the temple. And at the same time they're coming to the temple, there's a man coming to the temple. His name is Simeon. And our text today is going to show us a few things about how God reveals himself and, and what that reveals then about our expectations of him. So first we see in the text that God's revelation fulfills our expectation. It fulfills our expectations and is described here as righteous and devout. Righteous and devout. Simeon was a man who sought the Lord, who loved the Lord, who knew God's word, who had been reading God's word and expecting and anticipating the arrival of this Messiah. And because Simeon knew God's word, his expectations for this Messiah were shaped by God's word. His beliefs shaped his expectations. God's word shaped his beliefs. So God's word shaped his expectations. And because of that, Simeon's expectations were fulfilled by the Messiah because God always keeps his promises. Culture can shape our expectations as well, right? We, we show by what we expect what we believe. If you walk into a situation and you come with certain expectations and those expectations aren't met, you're gonna immediately be shown what you were believing should have happened in that moment. And in the same way, when we come to the scriptures, we expect our expectations are shaped by God and by what his Messiah should look like and who his Messiah is. Apart from God and apart from his revelation, the scriptures, our beliefs are shaped by a number of other things. Sometimes our beliefs are shaped by our experiences, right? Uh, I've done this time after time. This is what happens when I do this. So this is what I expect is gonna happen the next time I do this. And then it goes differently, right? Sometimes our expectations are shaped by the culture around us and what the culture says we should expect. Sometimes our expectations are shaped by our own sinful hearts. 
And when we walk into a situation and we've either set our expectations too high or we set our expectations too low, or we just came with a certain set of expectations we didn't know we had until those expectations, expectations weren't met, it reveals our heart. It reveals what we've been believing. And so Simeon comes into the temple that day expecting to see the Messiah because the Spirit was on him and the Spirit was guiding him into the temple. So Simeon's expectations were fulfilled because his expectations were shaped by God's word. He was looking forward to Israel's consolation. Now, when you ask a child if they're looking forward to a trip to the doctor for a shot, the answer is going to be no. No one's looking forward to that, right? Because when someone's looking forward to something, they're looking forward because they're excited about it. And so Simeon enters the temple that day looking forward to, excited about the coming Messiah, anticipating with joy the coming of the Savior. And he anticipates the coming of what he calls the consolation of Israel. And this is a term that points to the comfort that God brings. It's this way, when you console someone, you are bringing them comfort. And repeatedly in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Isaiah, God refers to the work he is gonna do amongst his people in rescuing them and redeeming them as God comforting them. He's going to comfort them through the coming of this Messiah. And so as Simeon enters, he is anticipating this comforter, this consolation and the Holy Spirit is leading him. And so when the Holy Spirit is leading and we are, we are understanding God's word and it's shaping our beliefs, it's shaping our expectations, God is gonna fulfill those expectations because he always keeps his promises. So not only does God fulfill our expectations when, we, when they're shaped by his word, but he also exceeds those expectations. God exceeds our expectations when those expectations limit what God can and will do. When in some way we've, we've not allowed God's word to shape our expectations, we've limited God, God's revelation exceeds our expectations. And so as Simeon comes in, right, starting verse 27, it says he's guided by the spirit and he enters the temple. The parents bring in Jesus. And immediately what happens is every young mom's worst nightmare. I want you to think about Mary, right? She's a teenager. She just had a baby that was conceived by the spirit in a stable. Now she's made this trip to the temple, which is kind of not real something you do casually. And she walks in and immediately she walks in and this old stranger picks up her child and starts singing about him. I mean, that wouldn't fly in 21st century America, right? You walk through Target, you got your newborn with you and your little carrier and, uh, and imagine, right? Ladies coming down the aisle, oh, right? They're touching your baby and you're thinking, what? Social cues here, lady. This, this baby is not for you to touch. Right now they make those covers, right? So you can't get in. It's like the Grogu floating egg, like cover thing, right? So you can't get at the baby. They make those now. They didn't have any of that. Mary didn't have any of that. So Simeon just come on over, picking up baby Jesus and starts singing about him. And he says this, now master, he's talking to God, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. Who is this person? He is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. And then it says in verse 33, after all they've seen, I mean, Mary's been visited by angels. I mean, she's seen some amazing things. It says then in verse 33, his father and his mother were amazed at what was being said about him. You see, God was exceeding their expectations in a couple of ways. First, Simeon sings that this Messiah has come not just for Israel, but for all nations. And this Messiah has come not just to bring some relief from foreign power, right? Which is what a lot of Jews thought, right? The Messiah was gonna come uh, and, and the Messiah was gonna, was gonna drive out Gentile rulers and, and remove that yoke of bondage from Israel and they were gonna uh, receive the land again and they were gonna put this Messiah on the throne and he was gonna rule Israel on earth and, and that's what they were look forward, looking forward to. But God exceeds that expectation here right? because the Messiah has come not just for Israel but for the nations and not just to remove the bondage of a foreign power of an earthly nation but the bondage of sin that resides in our very own hearts. God is gonna exceed that expectation and, and, and this Messiah has come as a light, 
not just to Israel, but a light to the world. And, and, and Isaiah talks about this. In chapter nine, verse two of Isaiah, he says, the people walking in darkness, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. Israel's expectation was limited in its scope and in its impact. Not just for Israel, but the Messiah is coming for all nations. And the light has come to those in spiritual darkness, revealing the way to eternal life. So how are your expectations of God limited? How are your expectations about God limited? What beliefs about God is that revealing in you? How have you limited God today? And what beliefs is that revealing in your own heart? So he came as a light to show us the way to salvation, but also to shine upon our sinful hearts a new way, a way to eternal life. And so God not only fulfills our expectations, he exceeds those expectations, but also what we're gonna see in this text is that God's revelation, it confronts our expectations. It confronts our expectations. Not only do we sometimes limit God, sometimes we simply believe things that aren't true about him. Sometimes we worship false gods. And Jesus comes to confront our expectations. So in verse 34, Simeon turns to Mary and to Joseph and he blesses them. And then he tells Mary this, indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So he he identifies two groups here as he's talking to Mary. He says, there's gonna be a group that rises and there's gonna be a a group that falls. So who are these groups? Well, the first group are the ones that rise and, and these are individuals who are lowly, who are humble, who come to Christ recognizing their need for salvation, who recognize the sin that exists in their own heart and the impossibility of salvation apart from Jesus. And they come to him in repentance and faith. And and because they've come in humility and, and in lowly stature, he raises them up to new life in Jesus. And then there's a group that comes to Jesus proud. They're not humble. They don't believe they need a savior. Maybe like many in our culture today, they don't even believe they have sin. They come believing that if there is a salvation that's to be had, they can, they can handle that perfectly on their own. And they come to Jesus in pride. And those are the ones that would oppose him, right? If you know the life of Jesus, you know those are the ones who would oppose Jesus and eventually put him to death. And Jesus says that those who come to him with lofty views of themselves, they will fall. Speaking to the crowd in Matthew 23, verse 12, he says this, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself and comes to Christ, desiring salvation in him, they will be exalted. They will be raised up. So Jesus confronts our expectation because he exposes false beliefs. Simeon goes on to say that Jesus will be opposed by many and that many hearts will be revealed. Expectations reveal our hearts because they reveal what we've been truly believing. So what false expectations is Jesus confronting in you today? What expectations, what false expectations is Jesus confronting in you today? Maybe you're here today and and, and Jesus is fulfilling his expectations, right? Your expectations are being shaped by God's word. You're studying it, you're learning about him. He's, he's showing himself faithful as you pray to him, as you seek him. Maybe you came this morning and in some way and in some measure, you've limited Jesus. After 30 years of walking with Christ, I'm, I'm still amazed at how God is constantly exceeding my expectations because in some way I have limited him. And and most often this shows up either in the small prayers that I pray or in the prayers that I don't pray at all. I've 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 limited what Christ can do. I've said, you know what, Lord, that I've maybe not consciously said this, but I've said, Lord, that's outside of your control. And God is saying, I'm gonna exceed your expectation. There's nothing outside my control. Or maybe 
there's a false expectation. Maybe you've thought entirely about God in the wrong way. You've thought, maybe I, I need to work my way to heaven. I need, I need to make myself right before God, before he can make me right with him. And he wants to work in your life to, to remove the sin from your heart and to help you to see the glory of Christ and to experience life in him. Is Christ confronting your expectations today? If he is, if he is, I wanna encourage you to lean into that. Don't resist the Spirit's work in your life this morning because you want him to reveal your false expectations now and not later because there is a day when this babe in a manger who died on a cross for you and for me, he is going to come back in triumphant return. And, and it's not on that day, you do not want that to be the day where your false expectations are revealed. So if he's doing that in your life this morning, if the spirit is at work in your life to show you where your expectations have been false, where your beliefs have been false, come to him. Come as one of those who are lowly that he might raise you up. What expectations do you have of Jesus this Christmas? How do those expectations reveal what you believe about the Savior and about his gospel? See, Simeon was waiting. He was waiting with great expectations for this Savior who would come, for this long expected Messiah, for this consolation who would come and free those who would believe from their sin to find life and hope and a rest in him. There's no greater gift for you this Christmas than Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you that that you love us, that you pursued us, that you came, you sent Christ for us. And Lord, we confess this morning that we didn't expect that. Maybe our expectations fell short or were false even, that this babe who would come would, would come to rescue us, would, would come to, to live a perfect life and, and die a substitutionary death in our place. That this, this babe in the manger would not, would not just die for us, but he would defeat sin and defeat death and, and be raised from the dead. And that this, this risen king is raised from the dead is reigning on high in this moment, inviting us now to, to turn from our false expectations and to give our lives and to give our sin to him to turn from our sin and to trust him and him alone for the salvation that he offers. We thank you, Lord, for revealing expectations, for showing us the nature of our belief, the nature of our heart. I pray that this morning, as, as those things have been revealed, that we wouldn't run from those things, that we wouldn't run from the work of your spirit, but that we would embrace what you are doing in our hearts today. We love you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.